Hey, everybody, we're back. It's Over a Pint, the podcast that talks about all the things that is going on that are going on in marketing. Um, marketing is changing daily. We're the podcast that gets you up to speed on what's happening, what's going on. Totally excited about the about the the content and the guest that we have today, Kurt, uh, Milt Wong. Um, and we're going to be diving into a little bit of AI, a little bit of MarTech, and you want to talk about a space that is freaking changing hourly. That's it. So we're going to try to understand it a little bit better, try to understand some best practices, what's going on, and how is other marketers out there? I can take advantage of what's happening because the genie's out of the bottle, man. There ain't going, ain't no going back. You better start leaning into it. You know, Mill, it's kind of like, and Kurt, too, it's kind of like where things were to me, like back in the late 90s, early 2000s, where people were like, yeah, I've got a website. This is I'm doing this. That was like a big freaking thing. Right. And it seems like history is kind of coming back with with AI. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me introduce my my co-host, Mr. Kurt Lingo. Kurt is VP over at Celtic Advertising, a full service agency located in Milwaukee's third ward. I'm Pat McGovern, new biz director over at Acedia digital agency located in Milwaukee's fifth ward. Again, today joining us, Milt Wong. Milt is the founder and principal of Mission Martech LLC. This is a strategic consultancy focused on helping people and organizations navigate the fast shifting Martech landscape. And like I said, this landscape is shifting and it's shifting fast. Milt is also a good friend, psyched to have him on. Milt, welcome to the pod, buddy. Thanks, Pat. Really, really looking forward to today's chat and I've uh, been following over a pint. Uh, great, great job by you and Kurt just to 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 get, you know, some great guests on. And and with the bend, I know that you guys, uh, um, you know, are willing to have others, but I really appreciate the focus also on on incorporating local regional marketers uh, in uh, the marketplace that, that we all love. So great to be on. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks Great again. Mel. Um, yeah, yeah, we're pumped. Hey, uh, Mel, it's called Over a Pint for a reason. We'd like to take a few minutes at the beginning of the show. Just what do you got? What are you promoting? What are you having? And what are you enjoying? Yeah, so this is uh, this is uh, what I'm having today on Over a Pint. Uh, one of two of my top favorites from Lakefront Brewery. And uh, everything to me is about sort of the personal professional connections and uh, River West Stein is uh, one of the local favorites from Lakefront Brewery in in no small part due to some uh, recent life decisions that my wife and I have made. It, it's been a lifelong favorite ever since uh, they started brewing it, but my wife and I actually just made a personal inflection point decision to uh, be empty nesters in River West. And, uh, you know, we just hit that milestone moment where our son left for college and we uh, threw a, a much longer story that I'll be happy to tell with anybody uh, that wants to join me at Lakefront. Um, <laughs> we uh, became empty nesters and decided to build a house um, literally walking distance from Lakefront Brewery. So we are a uh, wow. proud supporter of Lakefront and the investment that they made in this, um, in this community. And uh, yeah, absolutely happy to meet anyone and everyone listening out there. Just uh, buzz me with a message and, and I'm literally walking, you know, five minutes walking distance from Lakefront. Awesome. Wow. That's great. Um, great. First of all, I know because you're going to come to me on this next one, Pat. So I'm actually, <laughs> yeah. my, 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 uh, my showcase is not anywhere near as, as good as what uh, Milt threw out there. I've got, I'm going with uh, some Stone Creek coffee again today. It is local um, just because I've got a long day. But if I could, um, Milt. What a great, uh, great setup there, and um, very cool you're doing that. And uh, yeah, Lakefront is awesome. Uh, I like how you ended it with um, kudos to them for investing in Milwaukee, what they've done in River West. Um, I've known Russ for uh, many, many years. Uh, I, I applaud that company and him for all the reasons that you're, you're saying. Um, he really put his footprint uh, in this city and uh, has done a great job. So anyway, um, kudos to Lakefront. Definitely. Well, guys, today I'm enjoying another uh, Yankee IPA from Wisconsin Brewing. One of my faves. I'm promoting the hell out of that one. 
And I'm also jo- uh, enjoying a LaCroix uh, cherry and limes seltzer. Mm. Trying to stay well hydrated. Okay, cool. Hey, Pat, can I, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Hit and me. why are you having that beer? Why are you having that beer again? Why? Because. Because. Paul Verdu is going to be on the show. Paul Verdu is the CEO, I believe, of Wisconsin Brewing. He's going to be on. Boy, I don't know. Remember the exact date, though. Do you have that? I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's in June. June. He's June. coming on. Yeah. We're excited to have June. I want to say, I want to say the sixth. I want to say D-Day for Paul. But yeah, looking forward to that conversation. We got a ton to talk to him about. Um, anyway, that's not the topic for today. Milt is the topic for today. Martech AI. Let's dive in. But Milt. Set the table for us. Give us a little bit about your background, who you are. Get people up to speed on on your story. Awesome. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to just do a quick intro. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm Milwaukee native, so, so really proud to uh, support the regional marketing and tech community. And my, um, my personal and professional brand in terms of MarTech is very much based on my personal story. I took a non-traditional start for most uh, into marketing. I started as an electrical and computer engineer, which you don't hear that often uh, in terms of folks that are now marketers. Um, 30 years of cross-functional and corporate leadership roles later, it is a big part of my personal and professional story because then as the world of marketing got completely digitized, and I know it is, of course, you know, overly buzz, uh, buzzwordy to then say digital transformation and all that, all that. But Pat, you hit on it at the start, right? Is with today's AI inflection point, it literally feels like we are having that original dot-com transformation moment again. And that's really a part of my story. I'm happy to go into to more details, but you know, I've been in corporate leadership roles for 30 years, started at GE and G Healthcare locally. Then uh, about eight years ago, made a a personal professional inflection point uh, decision to diversify a little bit after 20 plus years at GE Healthcare. And, and, uh, you know, I've been at multiple different uh, corporate brands since that point, leading digital, leading marketing operations, MarTech, comes under multiple names. Um, But uh, late last year, made a decision to step away and pursue some new adventures and currently am focused in consulting in this marketing technology space, as well as, and and you know this, uh, Pat, from our prior backgrounds, also uh, getting myself involved in paying it forward to the next generation of marketing leaders. I'm getting involved in some teaching and, and higher ed opportunities as well. Awesome, awesome. That's great. Thanks, Mel. So, Mel, in, again, kind of in our conversations that we've had, you know, the marketing space is just changing so damn fast like it wasn't all that long ago you had to be you had to know some of the basics you had to know some of the marcom things you had to know about branding you had to know about you know that portion of it but just over really a a, a short span of time the whole tech side of it has just exploded and you know you think about cmos today and not only do they have to know about kind of the traditional quote unquote side of marketing, but they also really have to understand the marketing stack that people are, you know, their teams are going to be using or investing in or upgrading from, right? Yeah. Mill, how did you make the pivot, you know, into, into kind of that MarTech space? Like you were at GE, you've got this great background at EEC as well as computer engineering, right? Yeah. But how did you make that, that transition into that? Yeah. No, I, I appreciate uh, the question, uh, Pat, and I, I really talk about it uh, in that professional journey. Uh, and I, I love using the word journey because it's a uh, it's not a straight line path to to survive all of these disruptive trends. <clears throat> and you have to be lucky, uh, but you also have to make your luck along the way. And sometimes when you when you make decisions, you look back on it. And you realize, oh my gosh, it was it was critical inflection points, right? So just uh, you know, building on that story that I mentioned that I started at GE, you know, really at an entry level. I I started interning with them uh, even before I finished in in electrical and computer engineering, and it really taught me that then, hey, where you start is not where you're going to end, and none of us technically completely knows 
where we're going to be or what we want to be when we grow up these days, right? Right. And so G's got a fairly well-established reputation for hiring in technical folks that then want to move cross-functionally. And sure enough, they they supported my interest uh, in moving from engineering to operations. Uh, so you know that's that's why then I definitely wear the the badge of being an operations person as well. Um, and now uh, marketing operations is it's a huge focus of of mine. But really, what happened is is I expressed interest in moving cross functionally into marketing, and they gave me a shot, right? And it was that classic product marketing focus in the, the late 90s where you felt like you couldn't get into marketing unless you already had a job in marketing right? right and so i took a shot in an early analyst role right just to get my foot in the door and sure enough later you know uh six months later there was an opportunity for an entry-level product marketing role for a new business unit that g uh, g had acquired and right time and right place happened to align with when they were also sponsoring me to get my part-time mba in marketing uh, at Kellogg. So they had a Chicago business unit, needed somebody to head down there and figure it out. And so that's what I talk a lot about is that I you know, raise my hand and say, I want a shot, please invest in me. I'm gonna pay it forward. And sure enough, they, they, they needed somebody to cover that, that Chicago-based business because the majority of their, their, um, their resources were up here in the Milwaukee area and right time, right place, right? And you know that, that really was, the first part of the inflection point, the next part that I'm happy to expand on basically became sort of the dot-com boom, right? So there I am, felt like I had arrived, owned a product, owned a service, you know, helping grow out the contract portfolio for that. But I was also getting my MBA at, at Kellogg. And then the rest, as, as we know, is history. It was the first dot-com, you know, boom, and then subsequent bubble, if you want to talk about it that way, right? you know, I then joined, you know, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I joined the the center of excellence that was being formed around dot com at GE. So uh, I don't know if this ages me and there's plenty of other people that that could claim that they were part of the team, rightly so. But I still talk very fondly of being like the great grandfather now part of the core team of launching what has now evolved, of course, 20 years later to be GE Healthcare. Dot com. So the corporate flagship site for what was originally G Medical Systems in the region here than G Healthcare. But I mean, that was the wild, wild west of the web, right, at the time, right? I was the e-commerce program manager on a daily basis uh, fielding, you know, new web pages that needed to go live about MRI, CT scanners or whatever as we digitized our business. And, you know, almost comically, we, we could talk about some of those stories back in that day, because there were no processes, there were no brand standards in this area, vanity right. URLs with wild microsites, I mean, just the whole world, but the incredible learnings from that, right? So so to, to summarize all that, you know, Pat, back to your question of, of you know, how did I get into MarTech? That was MarTech, but we didn't know to call it MarTech yeah. in 99 or 2000, right? It, it was just at best, you 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 called it uh, the internet or dot com or you put a little e in front of your title <laughs> at the time, right. just if you were getting involved. So, yeah. Hey, hey Mel, two two observations real quickly. They're not questions, but they're observations that you kind of share your your background, and and I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that with us. My first observation is this: someone at GE must have read the book the book Good to Great. Because I'm listening to you, and it's like this is a, this is the typical example of an organization wanting to get the right individual on their bus, and from there the journey began, and they started figuring out what was the right seat for Milt. That was my first observation. Couldn't help but think that. The other one is the timing. You know, you were saying like, who would have thought? You know, and we hear this a lot. You know, with a lot of our guests. You know, timing is sometimes everything, and you look back and it's like, yeah, it's like the right place, right time, right circumstances. And boom, that's just, you know, yeah. spraying you into this direction. So just two observations that I just jotted down, like what a, we hear this time and time again, right place timing. But I had to throw that analogy out because I just yeah. was thinking about this is yeah. an organization that clearly got it because they, that was you. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm hopefully in the in the rounding area. I'll, I'll at least uh, claim <laughs> good teams, right? And then hopefully good teams then deliver great return on investment. Uh, certainly, I, I would never claim individual credit. It was a massive team effort to get some of those efforts off the ground. But to some extent, it was very much exactly as you as you mentioned, right time, right place. Kurt, I was one of the one of the few folks on that center of excellence team that was actually in source talent from the rest of G Healthcare, right? At the time, again, uh, Notion was uh, G Medical Systems at the time, but we hired in this massive influx of technical talent that because we couldn't find that internally, right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not it was marketing or technology talent, but I was one of the folks that that was watching this trend and it was very much to some extent, a little bit of right time, right place of the fact that I was also getting my MBA at Kellogg, right? I watched countless other um, part-time MBA friends leave their Fortune X brands to take a shot on a dot-com startup. And again, you gotta kind of like personalize your, your risk portfolio. So I was like, am I gonna do that? I was like, I've already built this sort of established sort of cross-functional hybrid, you know, persona at GE. This is going to diversify that that brand further, but it's still a risk because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So I didn't leave GE to still take the bet on the dot com, and that turned out to be one of the best you know decisions ever because then, of course, faithfully, some of the colleagues that I watched uh, from my MBA class left to dot com startups and got laid off in the in the time period that they were doing their MBA, right? Mm. And so it was sort of uh, conservative risk taking, if you will, on my part to to join um, and and really sort of influence the the, the next twenty plus years of my uh, career trajectory. Milt, you spend any time on um, on LinkedIn, and I still see digital transformation. Uh, people posting about that, people talking about that, and it's kind of it always strikes me as a bit like. Why are we even talking about this anymore? It's like, aren't we there yet? I mean, haven't yeah. we transformed? I mean, but yeah. obviously, if people are still talking about it, a number of organizations haven't. Right. And haven't. Okay. So now you talk about CRMs that have been around now 20 plus years, which is kind of just, you would think it's just kind of the ante into the game. And now yeah. we're going to start talking about AI and what's going on with that. Milt, let's start it this way. Give us the lay of the land from your vantage point uh, about AI. What's where are we at with this tool right now? And I'm talking about ChatGPT and Open, but you could talk about it in, in a number of different sure. ways. You 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 take the ball on this. But where are we at? Just kind of set the, the table for us in terms of marketing, right? Yep. Yeah. I I'll I'll say this first and foremost is that. One of the challenges, of course, uh, is the pace of change, right? So um, yeah. um, I'm going to sort of break it down in three parts, uh, Pat, is I'm actually going to riff a little bit on your comment about digital transformation, right? And then sort of story arc that into CRM and marketing automation, and that'll then end with AI as as my take, certainly not an answer, <laughs> but just my take on it, right? So my take on digital transformation, of course, is it of course is dependent on the industry vertical. So if you're out there listening and and your business was, was highly successful without transforming and really embracing uh, digital, full, first of all, full props to you. If you are still anywhere in the market leadership space and you haven't transformed, um incredible uh product or other strengths of your company right i think you know you're you're going to be forced into it you know but that's again because of always being tech centric in this in this in this world i'm i borrow shamelessly a quote uh around digital uh uh pat from from one of the conferences that i had the privilege of attending three or four years ago um before covid and the speaker that i, I Every single time I, I quote uh, him, I wish I would remember the name, but other people have said it, is that in the space of marketing, there is no more digital marketing, right? It's just good or hopefully great marketing in a digital world, right? And so yeah. completely agree with that take. 
Um, secondly, in terms of CRM and sort of core marketing automation, which is my area of specialization within the overall MarTech stack, it's influenced by my own pitfall, pitfalls and lessons learned, right? You learn more from your, your not failures, but your um, adventures in marketing and tech than the successes, right? And so after the original dot .com uh, uh, project, Pat, when, when we quoted, you know, jokingly, when we thought the website was done, <laughs> right? we don't know, you're never done. Um, the next chapter in my dual marketing technology background was I joined the Center of Excellence team to faithfully homegrown build our own CRM, Pat. Wow. Which would be unheard of 20 years later, right? right? Right. But yeah. then it's it's you, you ask for sort of like my take and and some of the take is when you've been part of these trends over the longer term, you're able to bring in experiences from from everything and not just latch on to the latest tool. Right. So, you know, CRM and core marketing automation to me is a modernized version of what you know I was taught at Kellogg around the four P's of marketing. Right. It's structuring rigorous programs, the first P, then informing and training the right people, always got to start with next with the people, then aligning processes, and then it's the platforms, right? And that story arc basically of CRM and marketing automation is the fact that of course, 10 years later, I was part of the teams, again, always a massive team effort of retiring and displacing that homegrown CRM right. with Salesforce and Marketo and other content management tools and campaign automation tools of the latest marketing automation trends, which now is 10 years ago of what I would call sort of the modern MarTech era, right? So mm -hmm. resource wise, uh, for those of you out there listening, we'll uh, work with Pat and Kirk to get this in the show notes. If you're not already following Scott Brinker and Chief MarTech, you know, it is, it, it's a seminal read, whether or not you're a MarTech and tech focused individual or not, he is literally known as the godfather of the modern MarTech era. He provided common language for all of us to even speak to this, right? He, he, he wasn't the only one, but in terms of just openly talking about MarTech in this concept and different roles and responsibilities of these sort of hybrid roles and, and ways of thinking. He really led the way. He's, of course, now uh, famous, or in some people's words, infamous for his MarTech landscape, um, uh, which has now been digitized. It used to come out as a once a year you know, PDF uh, graphic. It's now an online website, MarTech Map, if, if you guys want to check it out. He's partnered up with others. And they just released the 2023 uh, evolving landscape, and it, against all odds, has um, continued to grow to 11,000 plus solutions in the MarTech landscape, which is just, you know, to some of us, just unbelievable in the world of consolidation, right? And of course, now ending that with where you landed, and I know the rest of our time here is going to be largely AI influenced, is you might imagine that the AI impact on that landscape is what is going to be fueling this massive influx of new tools and capabilities, as well as, of course, an underlying theme within MarTech, which is there's always a churn and a, a, um, a consolidation, right? So those growth rates of new solutions actually sometimes doesn't tell the whole story because there's a massive churn as platforms incorporate other point solution capabilities. And that's what's happening with, with AI. It is certainly not just one tool. It is a platform wide shift that will be infused into every single tool out there. So, um, so sorry for a slightly longer response, but just wanted to kind of match the, uh, the story arc there, Pat, in terms of uh, sort of digital transformation, then core CRM and, and MarTech, and then uh, the, the tip of the iceberg that I know we're going to dive into now relative to, to the AI impact.
might have lost Pat there. Okay. Do All I right. Hit a quick hey, pause here. Well, you know, actually, the, the one question I have for you, and I'll just kind of, I'll just keep going because it's, it's, yeah. You know, with with your background and with with marketing, I just, again, I go back to this to my notes. It's it's interesting. You were saying how, um, you know, it's. I would imagine with with the way marketing used to be, how it was very, I don't want to say we looked at marketing very black and white. And Pat, you kind of alluded to this earlier on, like it used to be, be like this is this is the way it was. There's this level of sophistication and and um, advancement that's been taking place before our eyes for 15, 20 years. And I just I just can't help but, you know, think it, how it really has opened the door and uh, and really made things so that no, this is kind of where a guy like you comes in and why this is, you know, why you've been able to come in and put your thumbprint on it. And I think it's, I, it's, I liken it almost to like you were saying, I forgot how you said it. So you're going to say it better, but when you were describing, don't think of marketing this way, I think you were saying it's digital marketing. And how did you say that? I don't want to. Yeah, you, yeah it's, it's, uh, say that it's like, and referencing this uh, great speaker at a conference. It's not digital yeah. marketing. It's just good or great marketing in a digital world. Yeah. Yes. And it made me just think about how, you know, even from a more simplistic example, years ago, we used to always say B2C or, you know, consumer marketing. And a lot might say, yeah. it's like, throw that out the window. It's, it's, why are we talking about business to business marketing or, you know, consumer based marketing? It is just marketing. So I just, I couldn't help but yeah. wonder a little bit, like how yeah. I see some parallels there. So. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, um, I was just on a, a call last Friday with, within the first five minutes of getting introduced to another marketer, we were both riffing on the fact that it is in almost every single business segment now, it is some form of B2B to C as, as, a, as, a, as a value chain, right? And so once you conceptualize it that way, then you can't think of anything else because then it's, it's literally a value chain from a B2B marketplace, and then that, that last B is then influenced by the ultimate customer or consumer in, in that value chain. And it's very much actually because of the digital transformation, right? And I would say probably two thirds of my background is B2B, um, mm -hmm. but I would say for a long time, the B2B marketers, we kind of like, we're looking over the wall, we're like, we wish we could try that, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And very much the digital trends allowed access in a totally different way that the consumer marketers always had access to. And it was very much that customer engagement angle, right? I and mean, we didn't have to guess as B2B marketers anymore, right? The, the, the world of aggregate campaigns and, and we think it had this impact that, that of course the consumer marketers had direct data for we then through digital and the B2B space, we now had access to the engagement tracking and the data. So it equalized the playing field and it, it's all one. It's all one now. So sorry about that, guys. My head, uh, my my system froze up there, but I'm back now. Um, so, Milt, you're talking to a lot of people. You're you're you know, in your consultancy role and just you're out a lot in the in the market, just connecting and in. in what are people saying about AI and where in your estimation are they are they yeah. getting it wrong? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and this this I'm not the first person to say this. Uh, so I'll give the, the proper reference, at least where I picked up on it. Um, so second resource or second or third resource uh, that I recommend folks that I've personally benefited from is the Marketing AI Institute. So if, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. You'll, you'll see some prior posts to their podcast, their book. So I binged their podcast and their book. And the strongest recommendation they made to people is absolutely ChatGPT and the large language models that everybody uh, is, is now using is not just hype, it's real, but also don't get overly enamored with just the chat generation model, right? You have to then actually understand the underlying technology more and the fact that it will be infused into every single piece of technology that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, 
right? And so the number one um, mistake, I guess, uh, Pat, to, to frame it in the way that you asked it, is people that think it's just about the chat model, right? And not taking the time to actually understand the underlying technology of how it will be truly embedded into everything that, that we work on, right? So one working example of that, yeah. um, you know, that, that's very specific to the area that I specialize in. Uh, one caveat here is that I'm not sponsored by them. I, I'm a, a vendor agnostic individual. I just have had the privilege of access to, you know, launching and deploying the sales forces of the world, the Marketos of the world and the HubSpots of the world. So I'll, I'll you know, typically use an example from one of those three is that if you were already embracing and and running your business on the HubSpot CRM, right, then you've likely heard their announcement that they are directly embedding the GPT models within their core CRM product. Yeah. And you can experiment with it, right? So when they did that, I of course instantly, you know, signed up for their alpha and and beta uh, testing. And so that's a perfect example, right? So within their live email editor mode. Again, this is in alpha. They haven't fully released it right now. Um, but within their email editor, within their website editor, within their landing page editor, part and parcel to anybody that's working in digital, right? That's a core part of the digital ecosystem is email editor, landing page editor, and the content management system editor. You can then access a GPT content assistant, assistant to help you ideate, edit, summarize, generate new ideas. You can click the same buttons that are available on the, 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 the other interfaces to then take a more personalized tone, a friendly tone, a professional tone, right? So it's that active embedding of the capability in other workflows and platforms that you're already using. That to me is what convinced me that this is not just a tool. Right. It is an overall platform movement that most people are likening to effectively the dot com boom, but it's not a valid comparison because of the scaling and the exponential impact. Right. Because the digital trends that that we all know, right, because we kind of crossed the chasm from 20 years ago, right, took 10, 15 years to get to the current point. So AI is actually then layered on top of that. And that's why we're seeing this exponential uh, inflection point right now. So, so yeah, number one mistake is, is don't think of it just as the chat bottle. Really take the time to understand the underlying trend and the impact and how it's going to be infused into every part of the business world, but then specifically every single part of the marketing value chain that, that all of us are operating in will already in some cases already be impacted by AI or it will be just a matter of time right and then that time ratio has shortened as as well well you 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 touched on time and Kurt and I have heard this message repeated over and over and over again from a number of guests is that what ever time it took you to put together x project and let's say that project was 6 weeks yeah. Clients want it now in three. Yep. And this is just going to speed things up even more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's 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 all about access, right? So it it regardless of where you are in the ecosystem, right? If you're a client side marketer listening to this, if you're an agency marketer, if you're a consultant like me, time is completely compressed <laughs> right now. And then your ability to iterate and and test has just been massively scaled right and right. so all of these ratios right so um, i'm a big follower of the gartner hype cycle uh for those out there that, that follow that model but just pick a maturity model uh out there that that helps you embrace and, and move through different stages of embracing different trends the pace is the new trend Right. So the pace of change is actually the new trend because you're forced to adapt to it in in real time. So um, if you thought something was going to take X number of hours to research, right, that cycle has now changed because your AI assistant is now going to do it 
for you and summarize it in a way. It will not completely research, or sorry, sorry uh, it will not replace the need for that human uh, element. But if you are a content writer out there and you didn't uh, know the topic, right? You typically needed to spend a couple of hours and research to get your yourself up to speed, right? That time element has just been cut probably in more than 75, 80%, right? So then you can then attack the next part of the value chain, which is then summarizing it in a brand voice or, you know, whatever the, the case might be, right. the different form elements, of course, the production of marketing, if you will, right? So the value chain impact and the time compression is, is what in many cases is so thrilling about the AI uh, train. At the same time, absolutely all of us have been overwhelmed by it. So if you're out there and, and you haven't started to embrace it, um, it can absolutely feel overwhelming uh, to, to all of us. You know, if I if I could, I'm just going to take a step back here. It's like um, there's a lot to unpackage there, and I'm thinking about um, you know I'm thinking about a lot of our listeners. And when you look at AI, and it's a broad term, and and Milt, you started to really go deep, and you're like it's complex, but yeah. it is in its broadest sense. Yep. Yeah. You know, um, there's whenever the subject comes up, it doesn't matter if we're talking marketing or whatever. There's always a camp of folks that are skeptical. And yep. people are skeptical of things they don't understand. And I think one of the biggest things that you kind of underscored, which I really like, I wrote down the word, you got to understand it. You got to, it's not a matter of like, I'm going to get onto the AI train, or as it was a few years ago, I'm going to get onto the web train, or I'm going to get onto the social media train. It's like, think about that. You know, years ago, it was like social media. Well, what does that mean? Well, we've learned over time how we've really got deep, we've really understood that channel. It's the same thing with AI. It's like you got to understand it because it's a lot more than just a word. Um, yeah. And that's what's going on in our industry. It's like things are moving so fast, as you both are saying. And as marketers, we have to wrap our brains around this because we got to we have to understand it. Boy, there's a lot to understand here with AI. It's, yes. it's not a it's complex as you yeah. just got into complex. Yeah. yeah, it's I mean, even if we just take one little subset of it, which of course has been the last six months, right? So for those of us that have been involved in other tech-based ventures in the in the past, we have that, again, I talk about it as, uh, as a little bit of that luck, as well as then embracing the luck as I go along, Kurt. So, so, but if we talk specifically about sort of not getting overly enamored about just the chat-based model, Right. If, if we think about sort of it in in layers to break it down a little bit further, right? The first thing it did is, if you think about it, effectively, OpenAI, which is the most popular one that that basically we've all been riding on for the last six months, as well as their partner, they're partnered uh, with a massive influx of technology help from from Microsoft. That's been well covered. Um, if, if we think about that, they effectively gave access, first of all, to everyone, right? In the, the, the free access model, which has become sort of this, this, uh, this catchword in the industry known as freemium, right? right? So they gave access and that's why then it went through this, this curve to hit 100 million users in less than two months, right? But that's just one little subset of, of AI called the large language models, right? So here's one part that I've been in double clicking on with folks in terms of why that access plus large language model then hit the tipping point is large language model is often also analogized. There's lots of acronyms in this space. So I'll make sure to decode each one of them as natural language processing, right? The reason the combination of the access as, as well as the large language model, natural language processing took off so quickly is that it then made it accessible to the layperson, right? So let's then bring that back to marketing, right? What are we trying to do to either grow our business or keep our existing customers, right? We're trying to provide value and accessibility to products and services in a language that our customers or prospects can understand, 
right? It's it's mm-hmm. literally a proxy, right? And a metaphor for the marketer's role is we are supposed to try to translate your brand's value add, right? Either taking advantage of product and service features, provide, you know, some value added service in the natural language, quote unquote, of that customer, right? We all talk about customer experience is we are going to then drive value by meeting the customers where they are in their industry vertical, in their business day to day. And that's literally a metaphor for why these chat U, uh, UX's uh, user experiences took off is that it met all of us where we are, right? Yep. And then that's where then we as marketers really have to embrace that, right? Because at the end of the day, this natural language model is helping all of us translate that value in better, faster, and, and more effective ways, right? And that's that's even just like a little dip into the, to the technology without going in, in deeper into machine learning and, and the deep learning models that, that each of these things have, have taken on, right? Um, so, so yeah, it can get very, very, uh, tech complex very, very quickly, but I I like double clicking on just the natural language, uh, model aspect of it. That's very much why it's taken off. Milt, um, I fooled around a little bit with chat GPT and it seems from again, reading others that are really using it, um, and getting and getting the most they can out of it. Um, yep. the prompts are where you get the real value, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So, um, let's just take a simple thing. If you want to write a LinkedIn post, you know, you could say, Hey, write a LinkedIn post about, um, using, you, you know, using HubSpot as a, um, yep. as a CRM tool and it'll come back with something, yep. but then the refinement from that is where you really get the gold and where things begin to become very interesting. Yes. Milt, where's how do people get better at the prompts? I mean, is it? It's. Yeah. I'm sure a little bit of trial and error, but have you found sources that that you have gone to that say like, oh, read this or check this out, or do you have any kind of guidance on that? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I'll I'll uh, come out with another little. I don't know if it's controversial per se, uh, Pat, but it's it's potentially a slightly different voice. And again, it's it's very much just because of actively sort of immersing myself in this space is um, a lot of folks, of course, have leaned into to this world of, of uh, what they're now calling prompt engineering, <laughs> right? Um, so one take, first of all, is that we're, we're overly enamored on the output, right? Yep. The generation, and it's, it's uh, somebody on a podcast yesterday was analogizing it. It's, it's the dopamine fix of you know clicking the little button that says generate, regenerate, generate, right? It's almost like the slot machine dopamine fix. You can just keep on hitting it, right? Um, uh, so, but if we think about it, right? And this this is also my geeky engineer background coming through again, Pat, is the engineering in me told me to focus just as much on the input as the output. Right. Well, that's effectively what all this prompting in these engines has has done. We focus more now on the input. Right. So, of course, that can rear its head. Uh, I'll I'll be uh, blogging uh, next month about the impact of AI on data quality and data management. (laughs) Right. And we've all heard the classic CRM garbage in, garbage out. Right. We got to focus more on the input. Right. Uh, And then that'll get, you know, better outputs. Right. So there's any number of great resources out there uh, that are talking about prompt engineering. But the second take is that I think prompt engineering will be a short lived area of expertise. Right. Just because right now it's so new. But again, that fast pace of change is there's various folks that are already brainstorming overlay tools that will help people become better at prompting. Right. So think of a template based approach to prompting. Right. So the the classic rule of thumb for folks is don't treat it as a search engine. Right. It's not the same thing. It's actually meant to be iterated on. There's a feedback loop in it. Right. So don't overthink your prompts, but 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 think about active iterations and feedback loops of it. 
but where right now, because it's so new, a lot of folks are posting these great prompts and there's nothing wrong with this, right? This is the stage of technology and change we're at where they're basically posting like a paragraph long uh, prompt, right? I want you to act as a subject matter expert in XYZ space, take on this persona. I'm trying to come into this audience and I want you to summarize it in XYZ fashion, right? That's yep. any number of, of places, but fairly soon that's going to get commoditized. Right. There's going to be template based uh, approaches. A lot of folks are actually kind of saving their own template off to the side, <laughs> if you will. But you get the same benefit if you just start more simplistically, but you then spend time iterating. Right. And because, it, again, these modern these natural language models have a feedback loop. It's not just a one and done. It actually remembers your prior prompts and its prior responses. So that as you continue to have a conversation, right, with the chatbot, it is then iterating on itself as well as what you put in, right? Um, so one of the lead resources that I would recommend, lots of other people are recommending uh, him as, as well because he puts out great content is Ethan Mollick. So he's got a blog out there on Substack called One Useful Thing. And he is, he is um, once again, the reason he is uh, immediately getting recognized is he is translating it in such a way to make it a natural language for the rest of us. He's making it make sense to all wow. of us, even though he's, of course, uh, incorporating highly, highly technical concepts um, into his post. But yeah, he's he's one of the folks that that I follow. Uh, so again, Ethan Mollick, M O L L I C K on Substack. Um, Milt, before we we we're, we're coming close to wrapping this up, but I have to ask: in your experience, in your kind of um, your readings, your research, digging in, who are who's killing it right now in this space? Who are who are companies yeah. or organizations that are really kind of like they're already they're fast out of the gate and they're really moving in, in yeah. the right way. Yeah, this this is again uh, second time they're going to get plugged, but it's not because I'm selling them. I'm vendor agnostic, but it's really with with a, a hat tip of respect to the folks at HubSpot, right? So, uh, quick story, right? I was speaking uh, in March, uh, Pat, at a marketing technology conference, and uh, the event was going to be on demand and live. I recorded my. Uh, presentation for the conference that was going to be broadcast on demand. You can see how I remember it viscerally on Friday, March 3rd. By Monday, March 6th and 7th, Salesforce and HubSpot respectively on those two days released alpha and beta uh, versions of their tool where they're directly incorporating some of these GPT models directly into their CRM platforms, right? The reason that uh, HubSpot's getting just a slightly higher hat tip is the model that they released it in to make it, again, accessible in a natural way to their user base was it wasn't just a blog post. It was Dharmesh Shah, one of their co-founders, recording himself doing a live demo of ChatSpot their AI content assistant uh, tools. Uh, so there's two different tools. There's chatspot.ai as well as a content assistant uh, tool that they released. And the launch video was their founder doing a live video talking about these capabilities and doing the, the, the demo. So wow. huge respect for, for what they've done because again, they're, they're just continuing to iterate and innovate in the space, but they're making it accessible and being responsive to the community that they are you know, fostering around this. So huge hat tip out to the HubSpot folks, right? Because they 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 have uh, continued to innovate even you know since that point, because this the space, of course, is just ever evolving. No, we could go on and on on this, but we got to wrap things up. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much on the pod. Um, yeah. Milt, we always give the guests the final word. Yeah. So um, you've got the mic, sir. How do people find out more about you? How do they come in contact with you? What do you want to promote? What do you want to plug? You've got it all. Yeah. Take the ball and run with it. 
so two two things, uh, Pat. When we first spoke about me coming on for for this, you know, so you asked, you know, what would what would I recommend people take away? First of all, this has nothing to do with me. This has to just the pay it forward from other leaders in this space that you you heard all the resources that that I've been binging. If you are a leader out there or you are a team member, you have a responsibility, right? So if you're a leader in your organization, you have a responsibility to give your team time and space to embrace this, to educate themselves on it, to test it, right? It cannot be this sort of third rail that can't be talked about right within an organization. So regardless of whether or not you're agency side or client side in-house, you've if you're a leader, you have a responsibility to give your uh, team time and space to think about this, to actively test it, take some time out at a lunch and learn, everybody jump on and experiment with it. Of course, you've got to do it within responsible guidelines and we could spend an hour just on copyright legal concerns within this uh, space right now, right? If you're an individual contributor, you have a responsibility to not just embrace it personally, but to raise your hand and saying, hey, I want to be the, you know, pseudo, you know, initiator. I'll put together a summary for everyone else. And guys, we have to take this seriously, right? It's here, right? So if your leadership isn't doing it, you personally have a responsibility to raise your hand and help your organization, right? And so taking that time is is to embrace it and actively test it is is sort of a pay it forward to the entire, you know, marketing community that that might be listening out there. Um, so then, you know, for, for me personally, if, if I can be a resource to folks out there now that I'm, I'm uh, you know, in the strategic consultant role to help organizations um, embrace AI, I'd welcome that opportunity. Again, there is no right answer in this space. I don't think there ever will be. It's just, uh, you know, sort of uh, from my, my prior leadership roles, uh, you know, if, if there's an opportunity where I can help an organization, uh, I can be found on LinkedIn, um, Milt Wong, HWANG, or missionmartech.com uh, is, uh, is, uh, is my um, consultancy, very much uh, deliberately chosen in the sequence order that you kind of heard about my personal story, right? It's, it's about a mission, about the purpose, the objective of something first, then marketing, and then technology last. So, so Mission Martech uh, is, is where I can be found. Uh, and really, the the we, we need a community around these topics, uh, Pat and Kurt. So really appreciate the opportunity to come on. I'm just one voice out there, uh, but would welcome any feedback on this and and hope that uh, helped encourage others to embrace this because this is this is really this is really happening. This is not just a passing fad. Milt, thanks again for being on the pod. Cheers, everybody. All right, thank thanks you, Milt. Very much.